Hi. Hi, everyone. Hi. I'm Rifka Alter, and we're so excited to be here today to have this conversation with you about an important topic. Well, hi, everybody. My name is Suri Halpern, and it's truly an honor and privilege to be here, and it is especially an honor to be doing this with Rifka. So we're going we're gonna to jump right in. Okay, our topic today is passion and perimenopause. So um, when you think about this, perimenopause, I want you to take a minute and kind of tune in and see what happens for you when you hear the word perimenopause. Is it something that's making you feel like Oh my gosh, like the women on the right side of the, of the slide, this is amazing. Wow, perimenopause. Or is it more like perimenopause? Oh my, what's this going to bring? Or what is it bringing to me already? And are you feeling a little bit alone in kind of having to navigate this? More like the woman on the left. So our hope today is that spending this little bit of time with us will give you an opportunity to experience this a little bit differently and to expand your capacity and thinking about this stage of life. So in order to do that, it's important to think about, well, when we talk about sex in general, what is it? What is sex? Whenever I, I work with couples and I ask them this question, I get a very narrow, limited answer. And there is a woman um, named Gina Ogden who has since passed away, but she did wonderful work on expanding the definition of sexuality. So sexuality can be thought of in terms of four dimensions. And it really asks you to think about how am I experiencing the physical part of myself? And that includes my response to the five senses touch, taste, sight, smell, hearing, arousal, and orgasm. And the spiritual piece is like, what meaning am I attaching to sexuality? And am I experiencing a connection with my partner? The emotional piece is, is there love? Is there passion? Is there longing? Am I open-hearted? Can I, can I experience pleasure and joy? And the intellectual piece is all of the beliefs, thoughts, and messages, and including judgments that we have about our own sexuality and our imagining of dreams and fantasies. So this is a kind of a it's a it's a big, it's a big umbrella. And our hope today is that we give you a chance to experience a little bit of what it's like to think about your sexuality in a broader way. But Rivka, can you tell me um, or share with everybody uh, Judaism's approach to sexuality? Sure. sure. So, so I love how you really touched on these four different components of the sexual experience. And I just wanted to share a few pieces from the Torah and from some of the rabbis that really connect to these different dimensions. So we know that when we talk about the sexual act itself in the Torah, we use the word yada, which is in the pasuk in the top right. And yada, employing the cognitive sense, really shows how the connection between a couple is not only physical, but emotional, intellectual as well. I love this Ramban that's in the middle of the slide here, where we talk about the difference between the union, the physical union of people and animals, and how when we talk about a man and woman coming together and being lebasar echad, how the Ramban says that animals do not cleave to their sexual partners. The male approaches a female that it finds and then it leaves. Whereas for this reason, when we talk about humans, we have the idea of the female even coming from the male, a bone of his bone, flesh of his flesh, and he cleaves to her in this way where they have this strong emotional component as well as the physical of marriage. And on the bottom, Rav Salvechik puts it together so beautifully and where he says how marriage is not an extremely spiritual fellowship. Of course, we have those emotional spiritual connections, but there's also marriage without carnal enjoyment and erotic love is contrary 
to human nature. So we see how some different dimensions that Suri spoke about really speak to us from halakhic texts as well. In continuing, we talk a little bit about perimenopause as Suri started us off. And when we want to talk about a halakhic definition, so what's interesting is that the halakha really has, I would say, an emotional and a physical component to it in talking about this time period. There's no halakhic term for perimenopause, which can begin in our mid-40s, except as a yoet said, I would say, that based on the reaction of women to bodily changes, the anecdotal word to use would be frustrating. Our comfort level with our own bodies transitions, and due to some of these hormonal fluctuations, we may find ourselves in a state of nida more often than before, and at unexpected and often inconvenient times. We may have always had a positive association and connection with the laws of Tarat HaMishpacha, and now have possible feelings of resentment in keeping him. It's a time when, we, when we've begun to move on from time dedicated to creating a family, and we may be grappling with this new stage of life that may include grandparenthood for some of us or for our peers. Biologically, the term menopause in halacha is referred to as being a zakena, as you can see in the Gemara at the bottom of this slide. Nothing like that word to make us really feel old. And it can begin after having three continuous monthly cycles of nomenses around 90 days. It's interesting that the Gemara in Masachet Nida says that it brings in this emotional component and grappling with this time period when Rabbi Yehuda says, right, so again, that people refer to her as that zikina. And Rabbi Shimon says, anyone who refers to her as a grandmother, she's not embarrassed, she's not offended by that. So we're at the age where it is within the realm of where we are, but we may not totally have embraced this life transition, um, but we're not finding it offensive. So we're seeing a lot of different pieces here in terms of maybe how halacha refers to this time period. Marie, in your experience, how are you finding women shift responding to this shift in identity? Well, you know, first of all, Rivka, I love I love what you just shared because I think it's really important to see that the halacha is responding to that and that people form identity in a whole bunch of different ways. But many of the ways that we do is an internal, our internal sense of who we are. And it's very much influenced by the external messages that we get from other people. Like my immediate reaction to the Zakena was like, mm, I don't think so. But um, I like the fact that it that you're telling me I don't have to respond negatively to it. And so this is the thing, especially for women, there are all these constructs about how should your sexuality look or what really is the box that you need to fit into. And if you think about it, if you have to get yourself configured to fit into a box, you're constricted in a variety of ways. And it doesn't give you an opportunity to breathe and expand because I have to fit into this paradigm that's been set up for me. And a lot of this is based on the idea of function and dysfunction. And the number one question I get from women is, am I normal? And I'm, today, my gift to you is, you are all normal. However you are responding is okay. Because every woman's response to sexuality is unique to her. And it's based on her history, her experience, many factors. You don't have to contort yourself to try to fit into any box. Okay, so the question is then, what happens with love? What's love got to do with all of this? And there's a wonderful theory. Um, Rivka, could you go to the next slide, please? Called Sternberg's Triangular Theory of Love. And whenever I hand this particular slide, when I used to be able to see people in person, I would give it to them in my office. And I'd say, look at these, look at this triangle. Do you see the three points on the triangle? Intimacy, commitment, and passion. Now, the, this theory posits that love is a 
Love is a component of all three of these dimensions. In, in, in Judaism, we have a very big emphasis on the commitment piece. So even if I'm not really liking my partner so much on any given day, we have this really strong sense of commitment to one another. So sometimes our triangle can look lopsided. It can bend this way. Sometimes we can have a great passionate experience with our partner and the intimacy might not be there as much. So over the course of a marriage, your triangle will change. And it'll change sometimes in over a period of time, over days. But the idea of thinking about the structure of your love relationship in this way is very helpful for people. And it's also helpful to talk to your partner um, about that, about where, where are they feeling in terms of this triangle. Um, Rivka, I wanted to ask you, does uh, the halacha definition of love resonate with this triangle? And what's your response to it? Right. So I love this triangle. It's something that really does resonate. And I just wanted to share a few ideas that really stick out with me from these three circles. Firstly, when I analyze some relationships in Tanakh, I think we can see that there are those that had a greater emphasis on one or two of the circles and no even just, there wasn't necessarily an even distribution of all three. And we can really learn from all of them. So for example, if we were to take Yaakov and Leah's relationship, I think of the commitment piece being so strong and key, but maybe not as much of an emphasis on the, a strong passion between them in that side of their relationship. Whereas when we think of Yaakov and Rachel, it was the passion and the romantic sides that played such a definitive role in their relationship. Abraham and Sarah are described in the Torah as the paradigm of companionate love, where they have the emotional intimacy, working in sync most of the time, working together as partners in spreading the name of Hashem. And we also have the dysfunctional and abusive relationships too. The most infamous one maybe being that of Amnon and Tamar in the book of Shmuel Bet where Amnon's infatuation with Tamar was so great and went from being, he went from being lovesick to hating Tamar afterwards with such a passion and betraying her with no commitment or emotional intimate connection whatsoever. We can see the dangers of what can happen when there was only passion and no respect. And these elements are all present in different forms of our own relationships, as Siri said, at different times. From my perspective as a Yoetzet and Kala teacher, a lot of discussion is spent on all the, on the combination and interplay of these elements in a marriage. Due to Tomat Nida, there are times of the month when we, are more, when we are more accessible physically than others. And during the times when we are physically limited, the focus can be on maintaining and continuing to develop the emotional intimacy and the companionate love. And then after spending time apart, after a dunk in the mikvah, when a couple will, will rejoin physically, they can experience a surge of passion as they reconnect. So depending on our stage of life, different patterns may develop in terms of when we are nida and when we're not, and the structure that halacha dictates when we focus on each of these circles more intensely, and we can become pretty reliant on it. So then, however, we enter into perimenopause when we may start seeing changes and a new pattern that we're unfamiliar with, and we're not sure exactly how to navigate it. And it may include times when maybe the physical relationship is going to be more limiting, when cycles are shorter. And then as we approach menopause, a couple will likely transition to experiencing extended time being tahora and available, although their desire levels may be lower. So all of this can shift the triangle in, diff in so many different ways. And again, I just find it fascinating. Suri, what, what have you found helpful for couples confronting um, this transition and the changes that they're going through. Um, okay, so I think that one of the most powerful things we have is the, the way we talk to ourselves, is our own, our own narrative. So um, the negative sexual messages that women, th this is what I found in my practice, that women offer themselves is that I'm not a sexual person anymore. That part of my life is over. I'm way past that. I'd rather do something else. I'd rather watch Netflix um, or, or anything. 
um, to, and a lot of times it's related to body image because your body changes as you get older. So it's like, I'm to this or he's to that. And um, those are the negative sexual messages that women give themselves. But the narrative, the narrative of being alive is extremely important because we're alive in many dimensions, right? Professionally at this stage, which is usually in your 40s, but it can be earlier depending on medical circumstances for people, is usually you found some stability in your professional growth, um, your emotional growth. You have an idea about relationships that you value. There's a lot, a lot of stability in that for people. Um, but the question is then, what happens to desire? So what is desire, first of all? Desire is my capacity to say, I want something. Now, it seems simple, right? It seems simple to be in touch with that. I want it. But a lot of things need to be in place for people to feel safe and comfortable to want. And there's a lot of socialization of women around not wanting, not wanting to be too demanding. But in sexuality, the freedom to want is completely connected to the freedom to feel. So to have a relationship with your own wanting as being something not only okay, but actually beautiful and a source of vibrancy in your life. Um, Rivka, could you just go to the next slide? Because I, the next one really addresses this idea about, it's like ways when you're recalculating. If you think about aging and the different sort of changes in the body, you can think about it as something that's stealing your sexuality. It's taking it from you. But one message I really hope you leave with today is if it, you feel like it's taking something from you, it's taking one version of maybe what sex used to look like. But you have a very powerful position here. You get to decide whether your sexuality has left you all together. And if you have enough courage, you can reinvent yourself sexually and you can talk to your partner in a much more open and exploratory way about what you like and what works for you. And um, people really describe this area of life at this time of life as sometimes being an extraordinary time of sexual growth and connection. There's a wonderful book by Marty Klein called Sexual Intelligence. Um, and if anyone is really struggling with this issue, I highly recommend uh, taking a look at this book. It's full of good stuff. But one of the things which I would be remiss if I didn't identify here is the common changes in sexuality that occur with aging. And so vaginal lubrication will decline in volume and consistency. And I know we're talking about perimenopause, but if your partner is also experiencing some changes, which is that erections require more stimulation and may not last as long, and orgasm may take longer to arrive, and the intensity can vary, and there's also a longer refractory period, which is the waiting time between ejaculation and the next erection. Women at this age require a lot more physical stimulation than they used to. And I really recommend that if you're going to your doctor or gynecologist, that you be your own advocate because many women report that their, their gynecologists never actually ask them about sexuality and how it's going. So this is an area where you need to advocate for yourself. Um, one thing that Marty Klein's book emphasizes is what's sexually stable with aging. And these are all things that we can, we can relate to.
the desire for closeness, the desire to be desired, the desire to feel good in your own body, and very often the experience of orgasm and the level of desire. Content and quantity of fantasy, which we're going to get to in the talk, um, is also something that's sexually stable. So there are adaptations that couples will make. Let's say they are experiencing sexual pain. So Rivka, can you share with us what is the halachic response to some of these adaptations that couples need to make at this stage in their lives? I can't hear, Rivka, I'm so sorry, but we can't hear you. Thank you. I apologize for that. Oh. What, I was, what I was saying is that the, what I wanted to say, based on what Suri was saying, is I first wanted to point out an insightful piece from the Rambam, Hilfa Ushu, that discusses the need to love ourselves before we're capable of loving others. I think it really fits in with the idea of accepting of ourselves. And the Rambam says, Sheyehei Adam, that a man should, should honor his wife and love his wife, more than himself, that he first has to love himself so that way he can then love his wife like he loves himself. We can't give love until we work on the quality of our own self-image and then, of course, extend that to our spouses. We know that a positive sexual connection is an important value in the eyes of halakha. Couples may ask for rabbinic guidance about engaging in forms of intimacy that do not include penetration when penetration is not a source of pleasure for them. The halachic terms of biya shalok kedarka and derech evarim may involve ejaculation outside of the vaginal area. Poskim throughout the ages have weighed in on this serious halachic issue that has its source in Bereshit with the story involving Aaron Onam, sons of Yehuda. Their actions actually turned onanism, based on this, the wasting of seed, hashchatat zara levatala, was in connection with avoiding impregnating their wife Tamar, and this serious transgression brought about each of their deaths. Tosot in Yavamo introduces the idea of intent and regularity to this practice. The Rama mentions two opinions with regards to this form of intimacy and the possibility of zara levatala. Right, the Rama in the middle of this slide says, Boel There's the idea of right, having intercourse whenever at any time. Um, and Soti Mishto, the ability to do with his wife, Masha what he wants, um, whether it's Bia Shaloka Darka or Derech Evarim. And the Rama mentions the first opinion is Bilvad with the stipulation. Shelo, um, shelo that there will not be ejaculation outside of her body, that that is not the intent. Um, but then the second opinion is he brings, and he brings in if it's done, but Zerach Akrai, which we're going to talk about in a minute, something that's not done often. And then he says, right, there are those who are more lenient and will say that it is mutar, shelo that it's mutar, that it's permissible in this fashion, even if there was zara levatala, as long as it was done, b'derech akrai. Let's talk a little bit about what that means. So the phrase derech akrai that the Ramah mentions is interpreted in a range of different ways, from those who think it means once in a lifetime to those who permit it more regularly, especially when there is a therapeutic need. So based on this, some poskim will allow and say it's not wasting, it's not considered levatala when in the context of tashmish, of intercourse, as the fulfillment of feelings of desire between spouses and possibly connected or a definition of the mitzvah of ona and providing simcha and pleasure to one's spouse. This is an important conversation to have with a halachic advisor since there are so many different considerations. But it's important to understand the source of this and the principles at play that posts can use in deciding what's best for each couple. 
Rivka, I so appreciate you sharing this because this is something that couples, first of all, it's a very private and intimate thing that couples really struggle with. And I love it that you were willing to talk about it here today with everybody. Um, and it actually does transition really beautifully into um, the next thing that I wanted to talk about, which is a very interesting concept about relationality, because everything you talked about was sort of how halacha navigates the importance of the relationship and halacha, right? The relationship between the partners and how halacha will expand and maybe sometimes, I don't know if contract is the right word, but um, be responsive to that need. So that whole piece about relationality segues beautifully into this book that was written by Peggy Kleinplatz. It just won the um, book award for the, I forgot the title, something like Sex Therapy Book of the Year. Um, she did research with couples and she said, instead of studying dysfunction or things that are difficult, I'm gonna spend time with couples who've been married for a long time and who self-identify as having magnificent sex and I'm going to deconstruct their experiences and find out what is it about their relationship and their sexual experience which makes them kind of give it this tagline, magnificent. So what she found out, which should be inspirational to all of us, is that great lovers are made and not born. And the most important part about being a great lover is presence is being able to be fully present with yourself and your partner in the experience. And also, this is the part that's actually my favorite, which is a shared belief between the two people that we can have a beautiful and meaningful sex life together. What that means is that my partner is not only my partner in what's called Marriage Inc., you know, paying the bills, making sure the kids' needs are taken care of, working on home repair, but he actually becomes my erotic partner and we are an erotic team. If both of us, if both of us share that belief about our relationship, it's extremely transformative. But the single most important factor, according to her book, is actually empathy. And it is not sexual technique. That's really important for people to understand because empathy means, and I cross the bridge from my world to my partner's world. I leave all my stuff behind. I leave everything that I got going on with me behind. I cross the bridge to my partner's world and to his experience, and I'm fully present there with empathy. That factor or that capacity to have that attunement to your partner was the single most determinative factor in having a great sexual experience. Okay, so let's talk for a minute about the difference between sexuality and eroticism. Because when I work with couples, they really are like, what are you talking about? Well, you don't know what you mean by that. And this is from the work of Esther Perel. She says that sexuality is instinct or biology, but eroticism is sexuality that's been transformed by the human imagination. So think about that for a second. The human imagination. So it's all in my brain. Well, not all of it, but a lot of it, right? So it allows us to be curious, to play and go beyond our lived experience. And we can um, transform traits that we struggle with. For example, if I'm by nature a very shy person, in my fantasy, I can be dominant. And that's just one example. There are so many ways in which our fantasy can take us to places that we've never been before. Uh, there's, I know I keep bringing up different texts and books, but there's going to be a list at the end uh, of references if people want to go out and look for it. 
Catherine Hall wrote a book, and in the book, she has something called Sexercises for the Body and Mind. Oh, Rivka, next slide, please. So everybody, everyone has the capacity for this, no matter what kind of physical shape you are in. Every human being has the capacity. And anything that enhances excitement or pleasure, it can be the time of day, it can be the way the sun feels on your skin. So when women come to me and they feel like they're in a rut, I ask them to take a look at their experience of, of sensuality in their everyday lives. When you go outside, and we've been inside now for a long time, right? So this may resonate really strongly with people who are listening today. When you go outside on a beautiful day and you feel the sun on your skin, slow down, slow down and take in that feeling, that sensation. Because what we, what we bring into our internal world, we can store and then bring home to our partner. And also, what we may fantasize about can have sometimes absolutely no relationship to what we really want to have happen in our lives. So not to be alarmed by your fantasies. Just because you're having a fantasy about something doesn't mean you actually really want to do that thing. And fantasy allows us to distinguish between sexuality and eroticism. So uh, I, have, I have some very religious women and even people, honestly, even people who are not Jewish, who really struggle with the idea of, is this okay? Is this all right for me to be doing this? So Rivka, can you speak directly to this struggle that many women have about feeling free and okay to experience fantasy? Sure. Sure. Well, I want to I want to look at it I in two different pieces. pieces. First, let's First, talk, talk about how the Torah views fantasy in general. And I think that one, one interesting commentary going to the creation of the Mishkan, we read it back in the in Sefer Shmot, talks about the ingenuity of Bitzalel, the builder of the Mishkan. And we're told that he was able lachshov machshavot, to think, to think things through. And um, while some interpret that to mean specific types of craftsmanship, Targum Yonatan actually says that it talks about the greatness in taking an idea and bringing it into reality. That we can grow, if it's all of you as a partisan, and we can grow as people by experiencing and envisioning things beyond our reality at times. We know Yosef was known as a Baal Chalomot, a dreamer, which we know got him into trouble with his brothers, but ultimately it was this imagination and creativity that allowed him to conceive of things others around him were not able to and made, allowed him to rise in position to be second to Pharaoh. So that's fantasy in general and the ability of making that, those connections. In terms of sexual fantasy, we know the Pasuk and Shema that we say daily, the lo taturu achare levavchem the achare einechem, which prohibits hirhurim, thoughts, um, that come from what we see with our eyes. Um, and the halacha of, shmira, of shmirat enayim is really considered by most poskim to be an issue mainly for men. And there are rabbis like Rabbi Ovadia Yosef and possibly the Shulchan Aruch that do not say female hurim having sexual thoughts and fantasies are forbidden, which maybe lends itself to thinking that there, it means that women could maybe have the freedom to imagine and look at for ways to stimulate their minds towards passion and desire, sometimes maybe even from what they see in the media, when they can then use those feelings to enhance their own marriages and the physical intimacy and the connection that they share with their spouse. So if not prohibited, this could be an outlet that women could use that could enhance their physical relationships during this time. But sorry, what happens when these suggestions are still not working for a couple? Okay. Uh, yeah. So um, I just want to add one thing about 
about what you just said in terms of because this has helped some of the people just came to me this helps sometimes um when people are struggling with fantasy uh sometimes people feel better when they create a fantasy in their minds and they put their partner in the fantasy so that the insertion of your partner into that experience actually for some women makes it feel more comfortable for them and so that's just a suggestion for people who are struggling with this but um okay so what happens when all of these really lovely ideas don't work <laughs> for people and there are going to be times there are definitely times days weeks sometimes not months where people cannot access their erotic self so what do you do what do you do when your partner is interested in being in sexually intimate with you and you just are like thanks but no thanks and this comes up in couples therapy all the time all the time so one of the things that's been I think helpful is for the partner who is struggling with their own desire to look at their partner who wants to be sexually intimate with them and is asking for this experience. You can look at that person as, oh my gosh, I cannot believe you're asking me again. It is so annoying. Right? I hear that in couples therapy. Or imagine if you had this position, right? Imagine if you said to your partner, you know what? I really appreciate that you are not letting our erotic connection die. And that you're keeping this part of our relationship alive. Because maybe hormonally or physically or emotionally, I'm kind of shut down right now. But you're wanting of maintaining this in our relationship is a blessing. It's actually a blessing for both of us. And even if physically I'm not up for it or emotionally I'm not up for it right now, I want to say thank you. That experience in and of itself is quite powerful and transformative for couples. Because the number one reason that couples come into my office and I think into other sex therapists office across the globe and the number one reason they stop having a sexual connection is because the male partner stops initiating and once that happens once that gets shut down it's really a lot harder for couples to jumpstart things they can that you absolutely can but it's just much more difficult Okay, so let's talk about um, the do's and don'ts of communication uh, in bed about sexuality. Okay, let's just, just go through some kind of tips about what people have shared with me about things that work for them. Okay, so ask your, always, always ask your partner to do something you would like and talk about what you want more than what you don't want. So it's like as soon as you, as soon as there's criticism, they're shut down. And we're all very vulnerable when we're sexually and erotically connected to somebody. So in the moment, if we're being very criticized, it's going to shut people down. So instead of that's too fast, how about I'd like it, to, I'd like it slower. If you say, don't do that, say, do this instead. And eye contact, eye contact is extremely important. If something feels good, say so. If something feels really good, say so more than once. But don't ever, ever say that something feels good when it doesn't. Because your partner is gonna think that this is what works for you and then it becomes part of, it may become part of their sexual pattern and repertoire. And when you do finally come clean about, you know, that thing you did, didn't do it for me. You're like, 
there's a lot of hurt feelings about the fact that you never shared that all this time, which is not to say that you should not. You absolutely should. There's always the possibility of a corrective conversation and a corrective experience. Okay, so what do we need? What do we need to make sure that we feel good about this experience? One of the things is this idea that it is impossible to fail, right? And there are so few times in our lives where we really believe that because we're so success oriented, right? Did you get, did you get into grad school? Did you not? Did you get the mortgage on the house? Did you not? It's always very binary. Were you able to do it? Were you not? In sexuality, when you have an experience with a partner, whatever the experience is, it does not have to be success or failure. I want you all to just take a minute and think about that. It's super important to be able to laugh at sexual experiences that may not have felt, you know, incredibly awesome, but to know that you were there together and sharing an experience. It's not failure. Okay, so let's just go through some of the things, the criteria. One of the things is to be sober and create a better environment. There's a wonderful book by Emily Nagoski called Come As You Are, where she talks about the context that women need in order to feel free sexually. And a lot of it has to do with environment. Get your basic conditions met. Accept yourself so your sense of yourself is not on the line. Enjoy what you get. You can be sometimes be disappointed, but not devastated. Surprise does not equal disappointment, and disappointment does not equal failure. And I love, love this quote. To be sure of hitting the target, shoot first, and then call whatever you hit the target. There's a lot of power in that. And I just wanted to end with this exercise that I give couples to do and feel free to take this back to your partner. It's, um, it's from this woman, Gina Ogden. And what she does is she has couples sit next facing each other and they say to one another, I turn myself on when I. That's the, the sentence stem and you finish it. For example, I turn myself on when I think about what a loving father you are. And then the partner goes and you do it back and forth and back and forth. And it's actually remarkable what couples come up with. And you start with, I turn myself off. For example, I turn myself off when I think about the bills that I haven't paid. I turn myself off when I think about the presentation I have to give tomorrow and slides I still have to finish. I turn myself off when I think, oh, how am I looking right now? I turn myself off when I am worried about what my boss is going to say about the thing I just handed in. So, the beauty of this exercise is it puts the power on you. You own it. You can turn yourself off and on based on your own thoughts. It is a remarkable thing to become aware of. And when sexuality feels elusive to you and it's something you want and you don't know how to get it, like I just, I'm lost here. I want you to think about the power that resides within you to get back to that place. Because I can turn myself on. This exercise would be totally different if it was, hey, you turn me on when you, right? Because that's kind of the messages that we get in the media and everywhere else. It's like, what's the other person doing? But actually to have an understanding of this as coming from yourself is a remarkably powerful position to be in. And it's something that it could be fun to do with your partner. So I highly recommend that. Okay, so Rivka. So awesome. That's so awesome. 
And I wanted to piggyback on what you were saying and just talk for a few minutes about, I mean, communication is so much the answer to so many things, especially related to show and buy it. And when we're talking about having this um, positive and fulfilling marriage and how we really are the ones who can create it. Some of the some of the suggestions that you mentioned, even on the slide before and on this slide right in front of us right now, are really part of um, are part of suggestions that come up in the Gemara and the Mishlochan Arach for what we might call they're not halachot of a, of the sexual behavior in a bedroom, but sexual etiquette, if we want to call them that. And they discuss similar things about being aware of your partner. So being drunk or being asleep wouldn't be appropriate. Having an awareness and being face to face with each other of having the ambiance in the room and not being self-conscious, so maybe dimming the lights, of having conversation during intercourse be revolving on each other and focusing on what does turn us on about the other and not focusing on the bills we have to pay or taking the garbage out or on who's doing carpool tomorrow. So as much as we can focus our conversation and our moods, and that is something in our control, and the more we can communicate, the more we create the environment that we want and that becomes so fulfilling for us. So I really love the way it all dovetails so nicely with what Hazal have been telling us for years, and what um, and what we when what we get from we get from those who have important insights to share in marriage that you've shared with us as well, and some of the literature that you've shared. So here we are. Um, we're really at the end of our presentation, and we talked about how much power lies in us in terms of framing our experiences. And if we wanted to bring things together today, and were to ask you. If we were playing the naming game, what are some ideas that maybe you have for maybe what we would call, how we could frame this time period, what we could use to encapsulate this stage other than perimenopause? Going back to those original images Suri showed us in the beginning of what might come to mind when we hear that word, does something perhaps more inspirational come to mind at this point after our conversation this morning? And I'm not sure if we can have audience participation in, in this chat, but we would love to hear some of your suggestions um, and your takeaways from today. We could, we, Suri and I were talking a little bit about this before when we were saying, um, you know, things that we might, Suri, do you want to offer some of the suggestions you were saying? There was something yeah, there was some that yeah. came to my mind. Yeah. Well, I, I, I thought like, Instead of perimenopause, how about power time or um, forward freedom? <laughs> because if you think if you think about it, there's so many things um, as you get into your 40s and 50s. There's so many things that are easier in your life in many ways. You know, um, stresses are different or stress really changed. Yeah, stresses are so different, and and to kind of like you know, as as Orthodox Jews, we are big believers in the power of language. It's I mean, everything is about language and 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 words. I mean, that's our whole sort of our whole legacy is based on that. You know, people of the book. So how we tag things and how we think about them in terms of language is enormously powerful. Perimenopause is just not that exciting and it doesn't induce in people this sense of, I'm at a new stage, I'm wiser, I'm smarter, I know what I want more, I'm more confident, I'm more secure. Perimenopause does not encapsulate that in my humble opinion. Maybe not so humble, but um, so I think that as women, we need to look. We need to look for another word, and uh, so think about it for yourselves, right? Even if you don't, have, even if you can't come up with something right now, but talk to your friends. I think it would be cool for women to be talking to each other about what does this mean? What does this time in your life mean for you? And how can we own it? and name it in a way in which we support ourselves and we support each other. Right. So, yeah. It's good. it's good it's at a stage of life where we maybe have a little bit more time, maybe freer than we were when we were younger, where we have time to think about some of those things also, more mind space for it. So sure. here's a list of books that you had suggested that we just have up also, so if people want to 
put those down. Okay, okay, great. I, I, I do want to say, um, I do want to say Rivka and I did not know each other before we started working on this presentation. And um, I really want to thank her. And she has a really busy life. And I kept changing things on her. And she was only, only lovely to deal with. And so Rivka, thank you really so much. I have had- okay, You can't continue. I'm gonna have to jump in now. Oh, okay, okay. Thank you for all the information you shared with us. And this suggested reading list is um, very, is one that I, uh, I'm glad that I have it on my slides. So that way we can uh, benefit from it and your wisdom, intense wisdom. Okay. Okay, I just have this one shout out for Nishmat, okay? I have over the course of my career had different experiences with different Yolatzot. And Rivka, you are adding to the consistency of the remarkable women that work for Nishmat. Uh, they are all kind, smart, and lovely, and fantastic resources for women and willing to help women with their time and their wisdom and so really it's an honor for me to just have this like one little piece of this today and really an honor to be part of this conference okay take care everybody okay be well. bye everyone